So we've got another 10,000 holes drilled, which is great, and we're almost ready to install the floor. What we're gonna be doing at the same time is installing some chassis protection in the way of some skid plates, and also a couple of points that we can jack from. I wanna be able to use my quick jacks to be able to get this car up on, you know, up to a height to service it. And I'd also like to have a front and rear jacking point so that I can jack it up easily enough and, and put it on some axle stands. I'm still gonna need some, some low profile ramps just because of the height, the right height of this car to be able to get a jack under there to start with. Um, we can see at the back here, that the, the gearbox support uh, brace there sits quite low and we're also gonna have to contend with a sump here. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be installing a carbon fiber floor section here and the same on the other side. And I'm gonna rib nut in a couple of points that I can install a uh, sump protection guard there. Uh, just so if I'm driving along and you do hit anything solid, you, you're gonna sort of bounce up and over it and, and the sump's not gonna take the brunt of that, that force. It's Something that I'm just gonna fabricate myself, I ordered some resin and some carbon fiber matting off, off uh, a local distributor. When you're building something that's not a structural component, uh, there's no reason that you can't knock together some, some carbon fiber plate yourself. There's a whole heap of tutori tutorials on uh, YouTube about that. And you know, I wouldn't recommend uh, you know, producing some you know, wishbones out of some carbon fiber uh, as a novice, because there's, there's quite a bit of, bit of stuff to know in terms of material properties and, and the way that carbon fiber, uh, which is a fairly broad term, is actually manufactured. But for stuff that's, you know, functional, but, uh, you know, not structurally important, there's no reason that you can't do that sort of stuff. Uh, up here at the front, uh, in the center section here, I'll be replacing a couple of these rivets just with some riv nuts, and I'll install uh, just a skid plate there that will double as a central jacking point. Um, on the leading edge of the floor pan there, which you can see is quite exposed, I'll also be putting in some protection and also run something down the side of the, the floor there, just so if you do get hung up between the wheels, you're not gonna be sitting on the chassis or the floor and wearing that away. Uh, the material that you use for this, it's fairly important that it's quite slippery. It's a low friction thing because you don't wanna hit anything and then find that it's just gonna rip the mount out, uh, you know, because, it, because it's more solid than what it's mounted to. So uh, one that's popular is always titanium because it's relatively lightweight and solid, but you need to be very cautious of the shape of that when you, when you install it. Um, the one that's used in LMP cars and also in F1 is a material called Jabrock, which is actually a high temperature and high pressure fused timber. Um, believe it or not, it's uh, about 500 US dollars for a small amount of it though. And I haven't been able to find a local distributor, so I've, I've gone away with that. Um, I, it might be something that I'll install later because it's fairly easy to, to you know, um, obviously retrospectively install. Uh, what I've purchase is just a section of nylon it's a three meter long section it's about 40 or 50 dollars delivered it's easily workable you know i can chamfer what the leading edge and i can also drill some holes so i can bolt through it into some rib nuts um, other than that the only thing that uh, i noticed here when i was just drilling these holes is these two holes uh, are both into the same uh, bit of the chassis and i've offset drilled them and the reason that it's it's well, I think it's a good idea to do it. Whether it's actually that critical or not would, you know, you'd have to look at the chassis design. Uh, but the reason that I see it as being, being sort of important is because it's not hard to do. And if you look at these things, you've actually got some, some force acting up on them in this direction. And what it does is it actually has a compressive force on that that, set, that sort of uh, structural, structural member that runs between here. Now, what that'll actually do is that'll create a it'll try to make this this bend uh, and what happens is, is that the stress profile for something like this is sort of uh, like this uh, you have you have in this case if it's bending like this you're gonna have uh, high high compressive forces here and they operate at the extreme fiber which is right at the bottom and also you're gonna have some high tensile forces at the top and that's gonna operate right at the top so what that does is that uh, if you're drilling holes in the top section of this this bit of square tube here, you take a material out of the section of the tube that's actually copying the brunt of force in this case. Uh, the reason that, uh, if you look at this, this actually explains why you would have an I-beam. Uh, and the reason that they're shaped like this is because you have all the force at the top and all the force at the bottom. You don't have much going on in the center here. You can even drill holes in this and it doesn't really matter. Saves a lot of material, saves a lot of weight but you've got, you've got maximum material where, where it counts. So we don't wanna be drilling too many holes and taking too much material out of this. If you look at the top section of it, 
by if we have two holes drilled right next to each other you're actually taking a lot of material out this way whereas if you offset them you're only taking out you know one drill holes worth of material at, at any one point so that's that's the reason i recommend just offset drilling those whether it's important or not i don't know it just to me makes sense to do it i mean without knowing the actual forces that are occurring in this section of the chassis i don't know whether it's even close to its you know maximum capability but you know there's no there's absolutely no reason not to offset drill it so that's what i'm doing here uh so yeah that's the skid plate uh stuff that i'm doing underneath the chassis uh one thing that's obviously important isn't the jacking points line them up front to rear if you're going to use something like quick jacks or or even a, a, it makes it easier with a you know two post car hoist or something like that to get in the air but uh yeah nylon's a good material it's easy to machine and it's it's readily available so we'll get on with it and since I've got my MX-5 here in the air because I was cleaning the underside of it and uh, also checking the valve clearances I'll show you exactly what I mean in regard to, to chassis wear now this was done a couple of years ago at, at Target Tasmania uh, I was running the car and it's actually got a fair bit of ground clearance because of the type of vent that we're running it in but you'll see here that you can still stand to take off a fair bit of meat from the underside and this thing is nowhere near close to bottomed out with the fully compressed shocks and, and the ground clearance that we run, but it's just something that, uh, because roads aren't flat as distinct from racetracks, you can really run into issues on. Uh, now, disregard my exhaust wrap that's a bit loose there, I actually cut the, the steel cable tie that was holding it. Uh, one thing whenever you do start a job on a car you wanna do is you wanna make more work for yourself by, uh, you know, start mucking around with other things that are just in your way or, or that you notice that need to be done. Uh, it's easy to turn a, a two hour job into something that'll take you at least a day. I'm assuming everyone's relatively familiar with what they call a rib nut. Basically what it is is it's just a threaded rivet that you can put into a bit of solid panel that gives something that you can bolt into. Uh, they're usually made out of aluminium and quite a nifty tool because it enables you, like in this case, for me to put a couple along here. I can run my uh, underbody protection and then just bolt it up and replace it uh, as, as I need. Uh, the way that it works is there's just a gun here that's like a regular rivet gun you thread the rib nut on to an appropriate depth. So I'm having a bit of a moment here. Put it in the hole. And then it's just a case of you get a bit of a feel for it, but you pull it up until it's tight. That's it. Unscrew the die. Please hold, loading, and we're done. That's it. Then we can screw our bolt into it. Happy days. They're relatively strong. Um, obviously being aluminium, they're great. Uh, the only downside is that you have to oversize drill any hole as opposed to a regular rivet. So that's why when I'm using them in the chassis, I don't want to use too many of them. Where, for example, I'm going to be putting these ones here. I don't want to use too many of them because I'm actually starting to drill out a fairly large hole in this chassis rail, which is less than desirable. The other thing, which is a point worth noting in this section of the chassis at the front, is I believe this rivet line is actually going to end up uh, sharing a, 
a rivet with the un, with the uh, side pod. Uh, this this particular hole here is actually a locating rivet that the factory put in for the side pod uh, in regard to the body alignment. So I'm just going to when I put this floor section in here, leave a few of the rivets out, and that way if I don't if if I have to drill out some of the rivets, I'm not drilling out 30, which means that there's a whole heap of swarf that gets into the chassis again, and we sort of keep adding to that progressively. So my idea here is just to get that panel in place. I can whack in a few rivets at the end without without too much drama. It's better to be installing them than installing them, drilling them out, and then reinstalling again. Uh, I might even just because of the way the side pods are, and you know, just for future serviceability, just just use you know three or four rivet nuts along here as distinct from sort of 20 rivets. And then that way, if I want to remove the side pod, I can just undo those rivet nuts and and pull the side pod off without having to completely drill out the rivet line in this floor section. Anyway, we'll see how we go with that. Okay, so you can see we've got the rivet nuts installed and now it's just a matter of marking the nylon block and drilling it. Uh, what we need to do is we need to just mark where the rivet nuts are so that we can drill that out, but also mark where the rivets are in between because what we need to do is just uh, use a larger drill bit just to create a bit of a recess in the nylon block so that it sits flat. Uh, if it didn't sit flat, it wouldn't be neat and it'd be a bit of a rubbish finish. So we're, that's where we're going to go. But one thing that's important when you're drilling nylon is if you're doing it with a handheld drill, it's actually pretty predisposed for the drill bit to grip in the nylon block and just and just like burrow straight through the material so we're gonna we're gonna cut that out just on the drill press so we can hold it in a vise and not cause any damage to ourselves but also uh, not destroy the nylon block either anyhow that's how we'll do it so that's it for this week the floor paneling is done and my uh, underbody protections in so you you can see what I'm doing there uh, it's it's a massive job and it's certainly a bit of a, a bit of a pain I wouldn't like to handle it by myself so if you get some assistance you definitely are that person to drink uh, it's a cause of celebration this stage because once you get most of this paneling done you are well on your way to uh, getting stuck into the fun stuff I've had my fire suppression kit turn up the undo button as I like to call it and my Mtron ECU with a bunch of Bosch sis bon Bosch sensors so I can't wait to get stuck into that stuff and get it installed in the car and work out where I'm gonna fit it and how how it all operates uh, so that'll be a lot of fun over the next few weeks uh, I've also got to work out as, as I mentioned in my last video I've got to do my electric AC and and start to get well on the way uh, according to YouTube I've earned $45 from these videos which I never planned on doing um, as I'd mentioned earlier I, I'm not doing this for money so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that money to purchase some tools and if people want to drop a comment down below and mention what their project is what they're building uh, it'd be great if I can just I guess post those tools out to those people and maybe help them finish their project so you know drop drop some uh, info down in the comments um, tell me what you're building what what your idea is for the finished project and uh, you know if I don't earn much more money I think these king chrome rib nut kits are like 60 bucks I, I can buy one of them and I'll post it out to you guys with the with the proceeds of, of crime I mean um, YouTube and if, if I earn more I'll send out one of those kinetic customs hammers I, I love mine I think it's the best thing since can piss so um, Look, that's it. Uh, until the next video, which shouldn't be too far away, I'll, I might fill it in with some explanation about ECUs, what's available on the market, why I chose mine, the pros and cons of each, and, and sort of the price points that you're looking at. I'll also talk about the fire suppression system, and fingers crossed my motor is on the dyno this week. Uh, there's been a few delays because of COVID. Uh, I don't think the dyno workshop's technically meant to be uh, doing the work that they're doing, so I think it's a one-man band at the moment, and they're they're doing what they can to get my motor on the dyno and get it tuned and get it run in and uh, we'll get some data on it and maybe have a, a fun video to look at. Uh, I'll actually be covering the underbody of this uh, with bully liner as well. So uh, next time you see it, it'll probably be black. Um, I'll give you a bit of a, an idea out how that turns out. I use that product on my Land Rover to great effect. Uh, my experience with paintings, uh, probably finger painting in kindergarten. So it's a good product in the sense that it makes you look a lot better than what you are. Uh, so that suits me fine. and and it really just seems to adhere to anything and and comes up with like a, a really uniform professional finish in the end which which is great you know uh, without too much prep work and and without too much painting knowledge anyhow that's all for the next video uh, I'll try and get them out as regularly as possible unfortunately life gets in the way and you have to actually go to work and, and earn the money to pay for things that you you like doing like building cars or, or racing cars but um, you know, first world problems at the moment. Uh, I'm definitely enjoying this and it, it's been a great experience. Anyhow, as usual, if you have any questions, you know, drop them down in the comments. I'll try and answer all of them. I, I've been doing that reasonably successfully. So um, if you have any tips or there's anything you want to hear more of or, or that you absolutely hate, mention that as well. Anyhow, thanks very much.